can tell. Well, here we are. It's kind of fun to watch everybody scurrying around. Like a bunch of mice, yeah. <coughs> Good. Well, good morning. <laughs> good to see you. All right. Um, thanks. Okay, well, welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. Let's begin our time together this morning in prayer. Precious Lord, we love you. And we are so thankful for your presence in our lives, for your drawing us closer and closer to you the joy of knowing you and, and experiencing your love and seeing your hand at work in our lives. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. And all that is why we're here this morning, to open our hearts to you and to lift up our voices and, and praise to you, giving you thanks for who you are and for all that you've done. So bless us this morning so that we can truly worship you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. Okay, we got a few announcements uh, this morning. First off, I have made a, a couple of little goofs in the, uh, the bulletin regarding the, the youth movie trip. It is today, not next Sunday. If you... Want to go see Risen next Sunday? Please, by all means, do. But <laughs> for the youth, we're gonna we're gonna shoot for the 420 showing down at Tinseltown today, and we'll gather here at uh, 345 and leave pretty quick to, to make this showing, um, so we can uh, we can carpool down. I've got our, our kind of big vehicle, so I can take a number of us, and but uh, but we'll be doing that today. Uh, so please do be here by 3.45, and we'll, uh, we'll head down together. I've heard really good things about the movie. Uh, it's a story about a Roman centurion who's been sent to investigate these crazy claims that this Jesus guy resurrected, you know. So uh, it's supposed to be really good. Okay. <clears throat> also, um, last week we mentioned that this week we were going to, to collect used shoes uh, and it's a fundraiser for the, uh, the Nicaragua mission trip that Cascade High School is going on. Uh, Zoe is uh, signed up for that. So we had an interesting meeting yesterday um, on the mission trip down at Cascade. And, and because of the, the Zika virus, they have decided to cancel the trip for this year. So that was very disappointing for everybody. But... Um, but I know a number of folks have given money to support Zoe in this, and our thought is what we would do is put that money in a, basically in the account and um, get her set up for, for the next opportunity. Uh, maybe Nicaragua next year or whatever, but just to say this is still the goal. Um, so that's something that's been going on. Big disappointment we found out about yesterday. Um, really appreciated the reasoning that went into that decision, very much so, but yeah, it is what it is. So, uh, but the shoes, there's still, that's all still being compiled and it's still good for, for, for the cause. So if you've brought in shoes today, uh, that's great. And we'll, we'll take them down to Cascade uh, tomorrow. Um, and that'll all go to this larger uh, work to try to help, uh, help the school down in Nicaragua and eventually getting our people down there too. So long explanation, but I did want to let you guys know about that. Um, <clears throat> last week, we initiated a special offering, uh, apart from our offering during the service, but we had a basket for gifts for the Brazil family. Um, Sue Bauermeister kind of kicked that off. We're going to do uh, take that collection one more day, and then once whatever we've collected, we'll, we'll get it to the Brazils. Um, and who's going to be the point person for that today? Does anybody know who's going to... Carrie, were you the person? And Beth, were you guys working together? Perfect. So. Uh, I, I wonder if, if anybody knew that uh, Patty Brazil, the mother, she has, uh, is it MS yeah. or? Is it? Is it MS yeah. or she's, 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 is it she, Yeah, she's, yeah. She, she can't even wipe her own nose. I know, she's having so, a really rough time. So, um, yeah. and uh, so this is 
this gift is just going to be a, a cash gift to the Brazils uh, with, for the, the basket in Barnett. Um, and then the deacons have su supplied some, some sympathy cards. It's a great way to just add our, our love and our, and our prayers uh, along with that gift. So great, great, great. Okay? All right, good. Um, on, a, on a lighter note, we've got a, we've got a peeling party coming up. <laughs> Um, and that's uh, Friday the 11th, right? At 9 a.m. We've got KP duty. So, um, yes. Yeah. If you got one of those really like expensive custom made peelers, if you like to flash around town, bring it in, use it. Um, and that's all, and of course, in preparation for the St. Patrick's Feast, which is going to be the next day on Saturday, March 12th at, at 5 p.m. Uh, going to be some good, good food and wonderful fellowship and all kinds of stuff. Um, so if you'd like to help get ready for that, uh, 9 a.m. on Friday, March 11th, bring a peeler if you need, and, and then uh, look forward to that feast on, on Saturday the 12th. Yeah, Deb. <coughs> Teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Restore 
restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. invite you to stand together and worship this morning. Water
opportunity to have clean hearts in front of you and give us opportunity to worship you, Lord.
list that we've been working through. And then after that, it will be Palm Sunday. And then after that, it will be Easter already. It's, it is early this year, so that's partly why it seems like it's coming so quickly. But it's just coming really quickly. It's pretty wild. I made a comment a few weeks ago that some of the Beatitudes are what we would call counterintuitive. That they go against our instincts, our common assumptions that we operate on, while some others are a little more obvious. And I think that our Beatitude for this morning could be considered painfully obvious. But how we frame it up is maybe not quite so obvious. So let's take a look at it together. And we'll read again Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Precious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence here with us now. And we ask you that you would do a work So we all know it, but tourism is a, is, is a really big industry in our world. People are traveling all over the place, and they're doing it for, for sightseeing. And there are so many great sights to see in our world. You can travel to New York City to go and see the Statue of Liberty. Or you could head out to Paris, France and, and see the Eiffel Tower, or you could walk around London, England to see Big Ben. Or maybe, if you're really adventurous, you could go down to Giza in Egypt to see the pyramids. Maybe if you're less adventurous, you could drive out to Cocker City, Kansas to see <laughs> the world's largest ball of twine. <laughs> but there are all kinds of sights to see all over this world. But tr truth be told, nothing that we could see in this world could begin to compare with the glory of seeing God. Can you imagine actually seeing God? I mean, we really are impressed with the works of man, with the artistry and the ingenuity and the, and the accomplishments that we have come up with. And, and, and beyond that, we are awed by the wonder of creation, the beauty, and the power, and the majesty of what we behold. But none of it could, could, could begin to hold a candle to the beauty, and the power, and the majesty of seeing the Lord and Creator Himself. It's kind of interesting, several times in the Bible we are told 
that if we do actually see God, well, we die. We, our, our hearts and our minds are, are overwhelmed with his grandeur, but even more than that, our sinful souls are stricken by his unbridled holiness. We are crushed by the weight of his glory. Psalm 24 says, you, uh, says, says Psalm 24 asks, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, and who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Jesus put it this way. He said, blessed are the pure <coughs> in heart, for they shall see God. And this makes sense. This is brutally obvious. If you want to see God, you need to have a pure heart. We need a heart that's pure enough to endure the sight of God, to stand up under the weight of his glory, to survive the assault of his unbridled holiness. Jesus' statement is so brutally obvious that it leaves us feeling helpless. It leaves us feeling hopeless, because who has a pure heart? Do you have a pure heart? I don't have a pure heart. So what we make of this beatitude? Is it meant to leave us feeling empty? Is Jesus just rubbing in our faces the fact that we're never going to be able to see God? Knowing Jesus as we do, I think it's safe to say that that is not his goal. So how do we tackle this beatitude? And to start with, we need to look at the word pure. I don't know about you, but when I think about being pure, I mostly think about being, like, perfect, right, or, or, or flawless, like never making a mistake, never having a sinful thought. And we know that this kind of purity will, will not be attainable this side of glory. That's why it's important to understand the, the actual word that Jesus uses in the Beatitude. The word Jesus uses is the word for clean. It is katharos in, in, in the Greek, which is where we get words like catharsis or, or things like that, right? Now, there's a couple of ways to look at what it means to be clean. It could be physical, taking something that's dirty and, and washing it and scrubbing it until it's clean. But it could also be spiritual, purging from our hearts our pride and, and our greed and and, and our malice and our lust and, and our bitterness and our deceit. Cleansing our hearts of any spiritual pollutants that infect us. When it comes to having a clean heart, there are two things that the Bible is absolutely clear on. And the first is, we can't clean our own hearts. Proverbs 20, verse 9 says, Who can say... I have made my heart pure. I am clean from my sin. And if you didn't catch that, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> because we can't clean our own hearts. We can't wash away our own sin. It's like when you're working on a car. And your hands get covered with all of that wonderful grease from the engines. And you can try to rub and rub your hands to get them clean, but you're not going to get them any cleaner. In fact, what you're going to manage to do is just smear that grease over probably more of yourself when you're trying to clean yourself. What you need is lava soap. Amen? <laughs> Thank you. You need lava soap. You need a cleanser that's going to cut through that heavy grease. It's going to have some of that grit to scour out the grime from the cracks of your skin. Then... You can have hands that are clean. The same is true for our hearts. We can't do it on our own. We need a good cleanser. And only God can provide that. This is why in Psalm 51, David prayed, Purge me with hyssop, and then I shall be clean. Wash me, and then I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold within me a willing spirit. 
David knew that he needed God. He needed God to forgive him. He needed God to restore him. He needed God to clean his heart and renew his spirit. And so he asked him. And God is happy to do it. God is in the business of cleansing hearts. He's all about restoring our lives. In Ezekiel, God foretold a time when he would do a great work in our hearts. In Ezekiel 36, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. And of course, God accomplished this through Jesus and his self-sacrifice on the cross. Titus 2 says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. As Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, he took all of our sin, all of our lawlessness, all of our dirt and grime and impurity onto himself so that we could be washed clean, so that we could be purified, so that we could have hearts that are free of pollution and corruption and be renewed and restored to him. And the whole point was, it was his job. Only he could do this for us. There's no way that we could do it on our own. In this sense, blessed are the pure in heart is a lot like the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because we are blessed when we humble ourselves. When we embrace the truth of our sinfulness and, and, and brokenness and poverty. When we embrace the truth of our utter dependency on the grace of Jesus Christ. We are blessed when we abandon any sense of pride, any sense of self-righteousness, and truly throw ourselves upon the mercy of God. 1 John 1 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we are poor in spirit and we set aside our pride, then we can receive His grace. Then we will open our hearts to his love and, and his work of restoration. Then he can create in us a clean heart and wash us white as snow. And through this, we can enter into an active, living, loving relationship with God. We can commune with him. We can experience the joy of his presence. We can behold him in all his glory, seeing him as he truly is. Our need for God to purify our hearts is the first thing that the Bible is clear on. The second thing the Bible is clear on is that once our hearts are cleansed, we have an active role in keeping our hearts clean, in keeping our hearts pure. The Bible is clear we have a responsibility to maintain our hearts to keep our connection with God alive, to do everything that we can to protect our communion with Him. 2 Corinthians 7 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Like so much in this universe, our purity of heart is a cooperative effort. We need to work with God to pursue holiness and righteousness and to keep our love for him alive. As James 4 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's up to us to do our part. The Proverbs 4 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So how do we do it? How do we keep our hearts vigilant? How do we work with God to maintain pure, the purity that he has established within us? The Bible talks about this in a number of ways. Some of it has to do with what we do. It has to do with our deeds, our actions, our choices. Isaiah 1 says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from 
from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. What we do impacts our hearts. For good or for bad. Our actions, our, our practices will either draw us closer to God or drive us away from Him. And this is true for our personal lives. This is true when it comes to our own selfishness, to our own petty sins, our own pride and greed and lust and malice, and all the ugly ways that we pollute our own lives. But this is also true on a larger scale, with the way that we behave as a community the way we exercise pride and greed and hatred together, perpetuating injustice and, and exploitation, stirring up discontentment and contempt and conflict and violence and on social and political levels. However we live out unrighteousness, however we live out injustice, it will pollute our hearts and it will push us away from God. But when we pursue righteousness, when we work for justice, when we take our actions and their impact seriously, when we submit all we do to the will of God, then our hearts will be pure. And our connection with God will be strong. Psalm 107 says, The Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. So what we do really does matter. Another thing the Bible tells us is that what we look at matters too. Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, when Jesus is talking about good eyes and, and bad eyes, he's not talking about whether or not we need glasses. Because some of us would be in a lot of trouble. But what he's talking about is what we look at. What we choose to see. What we focus on. If we focus on things that are light, that are bright and pure and clean, then our hearts will be filled with light. But if we focus on what is dirty, what is corrupt, what is toxic, then our hearts are going to be dirty and corrupt and toxic. Our hearts will be filled with darkness. And we'll be sick and we'll be stunted because of it. There are so many distractions, so many traps and snares and pitfalls that work to grab our attention and to imprison our hearts and to keep us away from God. But we have to keep our hearts. We have to do that by monitoring what we see, by keeping guard over what we look at. Proverbs 4 says, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. If we keep feeding our hearts with what is good and clean and, and filled with light, then we'll be able to keep our communion with God vibrant and alive. A lot of that comes through our eyes. Now, the same is true when it comes to what we think about. It's one thing to see corruption. It's another thing to stew on it, to constantly mull over it, to fill our thoughts with all that is base and contemptible. Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. This is the case for those who find enjoyment in pondering things that are filthy. This is also the case in those who choose to fixate on the blemishes that they see in others. As they think about others, as they ponder them in their hearts, if they only think about what is corrupt, what is defiled, then they will inevitably corrupt their own hearts. 2 Corinthians 10 says, Take every thought into, uh, take every thought captive to obey Christ. We need to keep watch over our thoughts, submitting them to Jesus, seeking to live out his grace and truth, even in what we think about, even in how we think about each other. This is the great wisdom behind the Apostle Paul's statement in Philippians 4.8 when he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What we think about will impact our hearts. It will either help keep them clean and pure, or it will lead them to defilement, creating barriers between us and God. So we need to guard our thoughts as we guard our hearts. Now in all of this, what is most important for keeping guard over our hearts is what we give our hearts to. One of the key truths in the Bible is that our hearts are not our own. Eventually, inevitably, we will give our hearts away. The question is, to who or, or to what will we give them? The world is full of all kinds of things that want to lay claim to our hearts. But whatever or whoever it is that we give our hearts to, that will define us. That will limit us. And that will paint us with the desires and the designs of those that we give our hearts to. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot afford to give your hearts to anyone or anything other than Jesus. Only by belonging to him and giving our love to him and defining our lives by him and dedicating ourselves to serving him will our hearts stay pure and our lives fulfill their purpose. 2 Timothy 2 says, If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Through our love and devotion, we will stay closely connected with Jesus and will enjoy fellowship with him and will find joy in his presence and will find strength and beauty and purpose through our communion with him. We will behold the face of our master and it will be radiant with love and pleasure. And there is no greater sight than that. Amen? One time Jesus went to a wedding. And at one point in the wedding, they ran out of wine. And that was a major bummer for everybody. So Jesus had the servants who were there fill up these really big stone jars with water. Now, these jars were special. They'd been set aside for purification, for, for ritual cleansing. And all together, the Gospel of John tells us that these jars held anywhere from 120 to 180 gallons. Now, Jesus used that water to produce an abundance of sweet wine. 120 to 180 gallons gallons of sweet wine. And all so that the festivities could continue. So that everyone could have a good time at this wedding. Through this, Jesus showed us an important truth. That from purity comes joy. From cleansing comes celebration. God has done a great work within us. He has purified our hearts. He has shared his holiness and his righteousness with us. And he did, it, he did it all through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has washed us white as snow, and he calls us to share in the work of maintaining that purity, of keeping watch over our hearts so that we can keep our connection with him, so that we can live in the joy of his presence. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And there are all kinds of sights in this world, amazing things that are worth seeing. But nothing compares with the awesome joy of seeing God. So let us devote ourselves, let us devote our, our heart and soul, our thoughts, our actions to fostering a pure heart. So that we will be able to see God and we will be able to celebrate his love and his joy and his peace.
Amen? All right, let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for what you have already done. That on the cross, Jesus paid the price, has taken our sin upon himself, has purified us, has cleansed us. seek to maintain the work you have done so that we can stay close to you and connected to you and communing with you and so we can be used by you to shine your light in this world. Create in us clean hearts. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please stand together. the King, all glorious above, oh gratefully seek His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, who oh, tell of His might, oh sing of His grace. Robe is a light and canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of a storm. And you desire 
bring you honor and glory in every aspect of our lives. And Lord, as we dedicate these gifts to you today, we ask that you would bless them, that you would use them for your purposes, to shine your light, to further the work of your kingdom. It is our great joy to be a part of it. We give you thanks and praise, Jesus. Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. Word of God speak, won't you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place, and please let me stay and rest. In your holiness, word of God, speak. I'm finding myself in the midst of you. Beyond the music, beyond the noise, and all that I need is to be with you, and in the quiet, to hear your voice, word of God speak, won't you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. And please let me stay here, rest in your holiness, word of God speak. Precious Lord, we love you. It is a joy to know you, to share in your love and, and fellowship and, and to, to praise you. And it's a joy to know that we are able to come before you with confidence in your love and in your faithfulness. That you, you know us you walk with us and that your hand is on us. Lord, we just ask that as we offer you our prayers, that you would do a work in our hearts and draw us even closer to you. Thank you.
put confidence in you. We can know that you are faithful. So as we we lift our hearts and our lives to you, we just we'll trust in you. And we just seek your wisdom and your power and your love for our lives and the lives of our loved ones. And as we pray all these things, Lord, we pray the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. stand together once more. You are God in heaven and here am I on earth. So I'll let my words be few Jesus I And I 
Himself, took us to himself and just, just cleansed us, scoured us, washed us whiter than snow with the blood of Jesus Christ. What a great God. Mm-hmm. What a great joy it is to see him, to live in his presence, to live confident in his grace. As we seek to maintain hearts that are focused on him and, and, and built around his grace and his truth. May the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the love of our Heavenly Father and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be with us all.